uh, let's talk about the ECG. Now the ECG is weakness for the most because uh, you know it is a combination of the mathematics, physics and biology and most of us are poor in the mathematics and therefore we are in the medical uh, education. Uh, what is ECG or EKG? Some of you might uh, take the USMLE and go to the USA and then you will never hear the name ECG and you will call it EKG. ECG is electrocardiography. It is a transthoracic interpretation of the electrical activity of the heart over time captured and externally recorded by skin electrodes for the diagnostic or research purpose of the human heart. Uh, this gentleman, the William Ithnaven, in 1903, a Dutch doctor and physiologist, he invented the first practical electrocardiogram and received the Nobel Prize for the same in 1924. And uh, if you look at the figure, uh, if you look at the electrodes, huge ones, uh, there are some drums where the pay, uh, person has to put uh, the limbs inside. And uh, there was uh, uh, electrical activity recorded on the plates. Uh, it was by uh, what we call the, uh, it was by the light uh, measurement and light uh, waves which were recorded on the plates. Now the modern ECG machine has evolved into compact electronic system that often include the computerized interpretation reporting of the electrocardiogram. Now the two terms, the electrocardiograph and electrocardiogram are different. This is machine is called electrocardiograph and what the tracing you are getting is called the electrocardiogram. Uh, the machines is now becoming very compact, uh, mainly it is a computerized machine. You get different uh, measurements like PR interval, uh, QRS, QT interval, all are measured by this machine. And some machines also give the interpretation whether the patient is having ischemia, myocardial infarction, etc., which are not much reliable. So it is always better to know the basics about the ECG. Now the graph paper recording produced by the machine is termed as electrocardiogram. As I told you before, the machine is called electrocardiograph and the graph is called electrocardiogram. And we call it ECG or EKG. This is a classical tracing, a normal uh, ECG. Here, the 1 millivolt deflection is equal to 10 millimeter. So 10 millimeter is equal to 1 millivolt. And uh, one large square that is equal to 0.2 seconds. So one small square is equal to 0 0.04 seconds. This has to be remembered whenever we are uh, reading a ECG. That is, normal speed is 25 millimeter per second and amplitude is 0 0.1 millimolt per mm. Therefore, 1 millivolt equals to 10 mm and 1 small square equals to 0 0.04 second. Remember these two things, 1 millivolt 10 mm and 1 small square 0 0.04 seconds. How to do the electrocardiography? Place the patient in a supine or semi powerless position. If the patient cannot tolerate being flat, you can do the ECG in a more upright position. Now, suppose patient is having pulmonary edema, is not able, is not tolerating the upright position, then you can always uh, put the patient in a semi recommend position. Instruct the patient to place their arms down by their side and relax the shoulders. Don't put the arms like on the chest crossing and the patient should relax. Make sure the patient's legs are uncrossed, they are straight. Remove any electrical device like mobile and cell phones away from the patient as they may interfere with the machine. If you are getting an artifact in the limb, try having the patient sit on the top of their hands. Most of the time, these artifacts are because of the muscle contractions. Patient is too rigid, too anxious, or uh, no proper jelly applied to the leads. Uh, patient movement, loose electrodes, apparatus improper grounding. If the grounding is not proper, suppose we are taking this ECG with the machine on uh, electrical mains and not the battery supply. At that time, this type of artifacts can happen. So it's uh, important to have the proper grounding of the electrical supply. Now, electrodes usually consist of a conducting gel embedded in the middle of a self-adhesive pad onto which the we cable the clip. Uh, Clip-like electrodes are there. Chest leads, there are some uh, stickers-like electrodes or some ball-like electrodes to which we attach the wires. Now, there are uniform coding. The right arm is always red, left arm is always yellow, right leg is always black, and left leg is always uh, green. This is the color universal coding which is uh, universal across the globe. The six chest lead electrodes position is V1 in the fourth intercostal space, right sternal border. V2 is in the fourth intercostal space, left sternal border. V3 is between midway between V2 and V4. V4 is fifth intercostal space, left midclavicular line. V5 is level with the V4, but at the left axillary line. And V6 is at the level of the V4 and V5, 
but left mid axillary line. So this is how the chest electrodes are placed. How does an ECG work? And the ECG works mostly by detecting and amplifying the tiny electrical changes on the skin that are caused when the heart muscle re depolarizes and repolarizes during each cardiac cycle. So whatever the electrical changes happens during depolarization and repolarization, this is detected and then it's amplified and then they record it as an ECG. So uh, this is how the patient is lying supine. Uh, all the electrodes are placed. Uh, the left arm yellow, the right arm red. Uh, left leg is green and right leg is black and then we applied the chest electrodes v1 to v6 and then we connect it so we get the now actually the leads are the, these are the electrodes not the leads but mostly they are referred as leads so it become misnomer but it is accepted everywhere so now these are called the augmented this is the uh, right whenever you connect the right arm left arm and the left leg there are standard limb leads the lead one is connecting the right arm to the left arm lead two is right arm and left leg and lead three is left arm and left leg so this is the called classical ethnoven triangle this is the direction of the vector vector right to the left and upwards to the downwards in both lead two and lead three now these are augmented limb leads the left arm right arm and the downwards we are there is a zero electrical potential somewhere midway between the within the chest and we are taking uh, the electrical potential related to this though this is a very small voltage so it needs augmented uh, augmentation therefore we call it the right arm avr left arm avl and foot is avf uh, so this is called augmented limb leads the leads v1 to v6 we saw the position v1 v2 v3 v4 v5 and v6 they suppose on the chest wall they are on the close proximity of the heart so they are getting a good electrical impulse we don't need augmentation so these are simple leads these are not augmented leads just like avr avl and avf we saw in the previous slides so if we draw the plane then avr avl avf are in the horizontal while uh, uh, on the on the frontal plane while the v1 to v6 are in the horizontal plane and this will help in uh, deciding the axis just remember this because this is important as far as the um, uh, electrical uh, uh, positioning of the heart in the leads v1 to v4 represents the anterior leads one avl v5 and v6 are the left lateral leads two three avf are inferior leads and avr and v1 uh, represent the right atrium so limb leads bipolar are one two and three they are the standard limb leads unipolar augmented are avr avl and avf and precolial leads are v1 to v6 so when we are talking about the limb leads the standard are 1 2 and 3 and augmented are avr avl avf and precordial or chest leads are v1 to v6 so in summarize 1 avl and v5 v6 represents the lateral 2 3 avf are inferior v1 to v2 are septal and v and uh, v4 is anterior v3 and v4 are anterior so 1 avl v5 v6 are lateral v1 v2 septal v3 v4 anterior and 2 3 avf are inferior avr are none there is some importance of avr tracing we will see it later on so normally ecg wave remember there is a p wave q wave r st segment and p this is a classical ecg uh, wave now why it's called pqrst because all the nomenclature were taken away a b c d e etc so now when the ethnoven and uh, first trace the ecg use this pqrst and now it's uh, always uh, referred to as PQRST uh, tracing. So normal size, always remember the rule of three. PR is less is between three three to five small squares. PR interval is three to five uh, small square. QRS is less than three small square, and what we call the QT is less than the two large squares. And ST segment and PR are always isoelectric. This is the normal PQRST tracing. Now, if a wave front of the depolarization travels towards the positive electrode, a positive going deflection result. If the waveform travels away from the positive electrode, then a negative going deflection will be seen. If the wave travels towards, it is positive. If wave away, then it is negative. Uh, this is the science of a factor. Uh, you all, all must have studied in the physics classes. Now, the atrial depolarization is the P, then there is a ventricular depolarization that is QRS, and then there is ventricular depolarization, what we call the T. 
so interpretation of the ecg the more you see the more you know this is not something that you attend at one or two lectures of the ecg and you become master the more and more ecg tracings you see the more and more uh, ecg tracings you come across in clinical practice you will become master gradually obtain ecg act confident and read the patient details now if this this is the computerized ecg machine and this helps a lot heart rate you get you get the rr interval you get p duration you get pr interval you get your qrs duration then you get the axis you get the qt and corrected qt interval and then you get the diagnosis don't rely much on this but this will help uh, very much but we all will try to learn uh, just considering that you don't have this computerized ecg machine you have got the good old uh, manual ecg machines and you should know how to uh, interpret this uh, ECG tracings. Some ECG machines come with interpretation. This one says the patient is fine. Just don't rely too much on this. We will see later on. The best way to interpret any ECG is to go step by step. Rate, rhythm, axis, P wave, PR interval, QRS, ST, QT, and other ECG abnormalities. These are the headings in which a ECG should be reported. What is the rate of the ECG? What is the rhythm? What is the axis? What is the configuration of the P wave? What is the PR interval? Whether it is normal, whether it is prolonged, uh, whether it is normally uh, prolonged or it is getting prolonged and there is something drop. Uh, what we see the Venki Beck phenomena, we will see it later. The QRS complexes, whether it is narrow, whether it is wide, the ST segment, whether it is isoelectric, whether it is uh, upward sloping or downward sloping uh, elevation. QT interval and corrected QT interval, the T and U wave are also included in the QT and other ECG findings. And these are the headings in which the ECG should be reported. Now we first come to the rate. There are different uh, theories and different uh, uh, methods by which we can calculate the rate. Remember any one. Don't confuse yourself. So I will go by this method. Rate is equal to 1500 upon number of small square between RR interval. A very simple, every 1500 small squares equals to 300 big squares, but sometimes the rate is difficult to measure by the big squares because one big square half here, half there. So it is better to use this formula, the rate equal to 1500 upon number of the small squares. Now look at this. Now this is 1, 2, 3. So there are 15 small squares. So 1500 upon 15 is rate is 100. If we apply the big square, then 300 upon 3, that is 100 bits, but better 1500 upon 15. So 1500 upon number of small square between two RR consecutive RR interval is your heart rate. If you think that the rhythm is regular, the count the number of electrical beats in a six second strip, this is uh, only possible when it is a computer computerized generated and you are getting a six second strip. Then you multiply it by 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Eight QRS complex are in the six second strip. So you multiply by 10, you get the 80 bits heart rate. Again, you, you measure the number of small square, uh, 5, 10, 15, uh, and there are around, the, around uh, 15 and then 18. So 1500 upon 18. So it will be around 80. So with whatever method you just use, the heart rate will be same. You can also count the number of beats on any one row or the 10 second strip and multiply by 6 as I told you. If it, if you are having a 10 second strip then you calculate uh, this and you multiply by 6. So that will give you per minute heart rate. Now bradycardia is whenever the rate is less than 60 we call it bradycardia. Whenever the rate is more than 100 we call it tachycardia. The causes we all know hypothermia, increased vagal tone, athletics if the patient is very fit going to the gym regularly. Hypothyroidism, patient is already on beta blocker for ISD or hypertension, marked intracranial hypertension, obstructive jaundice, and even in uremia. Structural acinoid disease or ischemia can also cause the bradycardia, tachycardia. Uh, the rate is more than 100. Any cause of adrenergic stimulation, including pain, thyrotoxicosis, hypovolemia, and uh, uh, vagolytic drugs like atropine, anemia, pregnancy, vasodilator drugs, including many hypotensive agents, fever, myocarditis, they all can cause uh, uh, the tachycardia. Now rhythm. This is very important to see whether the P waves are coming regularly, QRS complex is falling regularly. So very uh, easy way is uh, take a plain paper strip and mark each P wave 
and wherever you bar two consecutive p waves the move this strip along your ecg tracing and see whether each your marking falls with another p wave or not same way you can apply with the qrs you mark each qrs on a paper strip to consecutive qrs and then you move your strip and see whether the other qrs is also following this pattern or not this is how you can measure uh, you can uh, just uh, determine the rhythm that is whether it is regular rhythm or whether there is any regular uh, uh, irregularity this is a normal sinus symptom the p is regularly coming the qrs is regularly coming you can uh, uh, see it by this paper strip method and determine whether this patient is having normal sinus rhythm or not this is the sinus bradycardia 5 10 15 20 25 30 35 40 so around uh, 60 less than 60 bytes per minute otherwise it's normal so this is a sinus bradycardia uh, 5 10 15 so this is around 100 or more than 100 then we call it a sinus tachycardia sinus pose whenever the prf pqrst pqrst is coming and then suddenly there is no electrical activity for a uh, wave and then suddenly the pqrst again uh, appears this is called a sinus pose due to some reason the SA node doesn't generate the electrical impulse therefore there is no p wave generation there is no qrst and therefore there is a sinus pose if this is too long then the ventricle and jv complex or junctional complex or the Parkin J can take up the electrical activity. We will say later on what we call the ectopic rhythm. The atrial fibrillation. Whenever the AFib happens, this is irregularly irregular P waves. There is no correlation between P, the, these waves and the QRS. The rate is around, um, uh, around 150 or can be more than that. This is irregularly irregular. And as I told you, there is no relation between these waves and the QRS. But if it is a sore tooth-like appearance and if there is a fixed relation like 3s to 1, 4s to 1, this is atrial flutter. The only, how can you differentiate? This is totally irregular chaotic rhythm of the atria and there is no relationship with the QRS and there is no um, sore tooth-like appearance. Here it is a sore tooth-like appearance and there is a fixed relation 3s to 1, 3 flutter waves, 1 QRS. So this is 3 to 1 QRS complex relation of the atrial flutter. Ventricular fibrillation, uh, these are just I am giving you examples to determine the rhythm. This is a, a life threatening condition, uh, totally chaotic rhythm, broad QRS complex. Look at this, this is a narrow QRS. This is a broad QRS. So this is a broad QRS, there is no P and this is happening chaotically. Uh, you can most probably you will not feel the pulse patient is uh, not having any pulse uh, palpated and this is a life threatening condition. This can go into uh, ventricular flutter and uh, the patient can die. The ventricular tachycardia again a broad QRS complex but a uh, little bit uh, regular. If you draw a line here all the waves around the lines they are of different caliber. This is large, this is small, this is large, this is small but in case of the ventricular tachycardia if you draw a line then the complexes will be uh, of equal uh, length and uh, depth. So this is the difference between a ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. Uh, the rate is around 100 to 250. Again, the pulse patient will be mostly pulseless. This can go into a ventricular fibrillation if not taken care of and the patient has to be given DC shock as uh, fast as possible. Torsa is the point test. This is uh, the term uh, which means the wandering around the axis. Initially means twisting of points. Uh, this is a polymorphic VT characterized by a gradual change in the amplitude. You see the gas changes. It is a big wave, small wave, big wave, small wave. But it is uh, making a figure like this, dumbbell-like figure. So this can be never forgotten once seen. Torsa this the point is uh, can happen with prolonged QT syndrome and whenever they are given some drugs. And uh, therefore, it is always better to measure the QT interval in the ECG. And treatment is always the DC shock whenever the patient comes to you hemodynamically unstable. The supraventricular tachycardia, anything happening above the ventricle is called the supraventricular cardiacardia. This can be sinus uh, node reentrant tachycardia or ectopic atrial tachycardia or multifocal atrial tachycardia or FE with fast VR or SVT or AV node reentrant tachycardia or junctional reciprocal tachycardia or AV reentrant tachycardia, whatever name you give, there will be narrow QRS complex. This is the difference between the ventricular tachycardia and supraventricular. In ventricular, there will be broad QRS. In case of the supraventricular, there will be a narrow QRS complex. The P wave is not visible. You can see a T wave, but mostly the P wave is not visible. Rate is around 150. 
to 250 and patient is sometimes hemodynamically stable. You can measure the BP. Patient can be in hypotension, but you can still feel the pulse and you can still measure the BP in such patients. Atrial escape rhythm is a cardiac dysrhythmia occurring when sustained suppression of sinus impulse formation causing the other atrial foci to take the pacemaker function. Now look at the morphology of this P wave. There is a pause and then suddenly the P wave starts appearing here but the morphology is different and therefore this is called a atrial escape rhythm. The SA node is not functioning and some of the other part of the uh, atria has taken the function of the SA node and therefore the morphology is different but the QRS morphology and the rate will be almost similar in these patients. The junctional escape. Suddenly there is a cutoff of the P wave generation from the SA node. There is no activity for some time and then suddenly the uh, rhythm starts. But here the P wave is either absent or it is inverted because it is uh, traveling from the junction to the atria. So this there can be a inverted P wave in the junctional escape rhythm. The ventricular escape rhythm, whenever the SA node is not generating, the junction is not generating, then the ventricle has to start the generating the cardiac impulse and this we call the ventricle escape rhythm. Now not the broad QRS complexes, till the junctional the QRS are narrow. In the atrial escape rhythm also the QRS is narrow, but in case of the ventricle escape rhythm, the QRS will be wide. The depolarization spreads slowly via the abnormal pathway in the ventricle myocardium and not via the his bundle and bundle branches. The atrial premature beat. Uh, there are different type of premature beats, the atrial, the junctional and the ventricle premature beat. Then the atrial premature beats, you can see this PQRC complex. Suddenly there is a different morphology of the P wave uh, appears and this will be followed by a compensatory pose and then there will be a normal PQRST complex. So this is called atrial premature beat or we call atrial premature contraction. QRS is normal, it is not wide. In the junctional premature beat, normal PQRST, there is suddenly a wave which he is not having a P wave or inverted P wave and then there will be a pose the compensatory force and then there will be a normal PQRST. This is called the junctional premature beat or a junctional premature complex. The ventricular premature beat or VPC or PVC is normal PQRST. Then suddenly there is ectopic beat which does, doesn't have the P wave and the QRS will be broad. This is called the ventricular premature beat, ventricular premature contraction or VPC, PVB or PV, VPC. Asystole means there is total absence of cardiac activity. There is no, there is only a straight line. This is mainly seen in Hindi films, the asystole. But whenever you are seeing asystole, first you determine that this is an asystole because of the no activity of the heart and not because of some limb positioning problems. The limb should be attached properly and then and then you can see that this is asystole related to the heart. The pulseless electrical activity, sometimes the patient is dead but still you get this, this rhythm and this can be because of the pacemaker activity still going on in the heart very rare but this can happen whether the patient when, when the patient is having external pacemaker inserted or internal pacemaker inserted but at that time the pacemaker spike should come. Now this is the pacemaker spike. Whenever the patient is having a pacemaker inserted, you will not get the typical P wave, but you will get this pacemaker spike and you will get the somewhat wide QRS complex followed by the T. Now the cardiac axis. This is found very difficult by few people, but uh, clinically, in clinical practice, it is not that much important to give a uh, uh, axis in minus 90 or that figure like thing, you should know what is left axis deviation, what is right axis deviation, that is sufficient. So the cardiac axis refers to the general direction of the heart depolarization wave front, that is electrical vector in the frontal plane. With a healthy conductive system, the cardiac axis is related to where the major muscle bulk of the heart lies. The electrical impulses that travels towards the electrode produces upright as we saw in the previous slide, away is negative and uh, whenever it is uh, uh, isoelectric, then there is a uh, something called uh, equivocal response. This is a negative, this is a positive, and this is a equivocal. So negative means it is away from uh, the wave, it is uh, opposite to the wave. Uh, whenever it is uh, in the direction of the lead, it will give positive. And when the lead is isoelectric, it will give what we call the isophasic deflection. The positive and negative will be equal in size. So QRS axis, um, uh, the QRS axis normal is this, plus 90 to minus 30, minus 30 to minus 90, we call it left axis deviation, plus 90 to plus 180, we call it right axis deviation, and plus, uh, plus 180 to minus 90 is indeterminate when we are not much concerned about this. 
So minus 30 to minus 90 is LID plus 90 to plus 180 is RID. So we will go to this quadrant approach. We are not uh, much touching the equiphasic approach. Equiphasic means this, what I uh, showed you here, the equiphasic. And axis can be determined by looking at the lead, which is equiphasic. But we will only touch the quadrant approach. Look at the predominantly positive and predominantly negative in lead 1 and AVF. If lead 1 is having a predominantly positive, AVF is having predominantly negative, then this is called a left axis deviation. Remember like this, 1 is on the left side of the your ECG tracing, EAVF is on the right side of your ECG tracing. When the right side is negative, it is left axis. Suppose this is um, uh, reverse. The 1 is predominantly negative and AVF is predominantly positive. So in the, on your ECG tracing, the left side of the lead that is 1 is predominantly negative. The AVF that is on the right side is predominantly positive. So predominantly negative deflection is on the left side of tracing. This is a right axis deviation. So that is reverse. Again, I explain. You look at the 1 and AVF. If 1 is positive, AVF is negative. It is left axis deviation. You can look at the 1 and AVF. If 1 is negative, AVF is positive. It is a right axis deviation. But there is a variation. Positive in 1, negative in AVF, predominantly positive in lead 2. This is a non-pathologic LAD. We call it normal. Look at this. 1 is positive, AVF is negative. So we normally call it a left axis deviation. But at the same time, look at the lead 2. If the lead 2 is positive, this is a normal axis. This is not a pathological LAD. We call it a normal. But if your 1 is uh, negative, 1 is positive, AVF is ne uh, negative and 2 is also negative, we call it left axis deviation. If 1 is negative, AVF is positive, we call it a right axis deviation. So the causes of the lactic deviation are pregnancy, obesity, ascites. Whenever the uh, abdomen is large, there will be lactic axis deviation, abdominal distension, left entry, hemiblock. Now, whenever there is uh, this type of pattern, in 2, 3 and AVF, the RS pattern in 2, 3 and AVF and we call it a left axis deviation as well as the LAHB, the left anti anterior hemi block. Whenever there is a 1 and AVL is having this RS type of pattern, we call it LPHB, left posterior hemi block. Right axis deviation is more normally finding children, tall thin adults, COPD, left posterior hemi blocks, Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, anterolateral MI, and Northwest is uncommon but mainly seen in hyperkalemia, uh, emphysema. Uh, always check the position of the limb leads. Sometimes the left and right arm are reversed, and sometimes the foot are reversed. This can give you this weird axis. So always check the electrode first before uh, stamping the patient having a Northwest axis. Now we come to the P wave. Normally, it is the 3 small square or 2.5 small square is the elevation, 3 square, small square is the breadth and uh, this is the normal P wave. Uh, it is 3 small square wide, 2.5 small square high, always positive in lead 1 and 2 and in, in normal sinus rhythm, it is always positive in lead 1 and lead 2, always negative in AVR. So, AVR is always, I call it a uh, mirror, when one of all leads are positive, the AVR will be negative and commonly biphasic in lead 1. So whenever you are getting a biphasic uh, P wave in lead V1, don't uh, think that this is P mitral or something. It is always normal. So always look in the lead 1 and 2 for the P wave. And whenever the V1 is showing biphasic, just ignore. And it is always negative in AVR, so just ignore. This is the P pulmonale. The tall peak P is P pulmonale. This is the biphasic P wave. There are two uh, phases. One is positive, one is negative. And this is the P mitral, just like M shift. The M shaped is P mitral and it is seen in the mitral stenosis. The P pulmonal is seen in the pulmonary hypertension and uh, right atrial environment of the right sided uh, heart conditions. The biphasic P wave is also sign of a left atrial enlargement, but it is seen in other conditions than the mitral stenosis. In mitral stenosis, the P mitral is uh, characteristic. The PR interval is the interval between the beginning of P to the end of the R. The beginning of the P to end of the R is 3 to 5 small square. That is, each small square is 0 0.04 seconds. So, this will be 120 to 200 milliseconds. So, 0.12 second is the normal PR interval. Up to 0.20 it's normal. If it is more than that, then we call it the prolonged PR interval. And PR is always isoelectric, just like a ST segment. Now, the PR is more than 5 small square, more than 5 small square, more than 5. So, this is... A prolonged PR interval. This is more than uh, 
0.20 or more than 200 milliseconds. This is called a prolonged PR interval of first degree heart block. You see this is more than the beginning of P to the end of the R is more than the 5 small square and therefore we call it the first degree heart block. The beginning of P to the end of the R. That is why we are measuring this interval. The morbid type 1 or Wenke-Beck phenomena, there is prolongation of the PR and then there is suddenly no impulse generating the uh, wave going to the Q, uh, forming the QRS complex. So PR gradually there is widening. You, here you see the PR is this much, then this much, then this much, then only P, no QRS, then again PR, again it's widening, again it's widening and then there will be only P, no QRS. So this is called morbid type 1 or Wenke-Beck phenomena. Runs in cycle, first PR interval is normal with successive beat the PR interval lengthens until there will be a P wave with no following QRS complex. What happens is the AV delay is more. This is AV delay, this is AV delay, this is AV delay and then the AV is so refractory that it doesn't transmit the P wave to the ventricles. So P wave will not be followed by the QRS. This is called Wenke-Beck phenomena or Morbid's type 1 block. The Morbid's type 2, here the P wave and QRS are totally dissociated. PR interval is constant, duration is normal or prolonged, periodically no conduction between the atria and ventricles. So whatever happens, P, no QRS, then suddenly P, the PR interval it can be normal or broad, but it is fixed. P, QRST, P, QRST, P, QRST for few waves. The PR is constant. Then suddenly there is P and no QRS. So this is a AV dissociation happening at a normal interval. And in between the AV dissociation, the PR interval is constant. There is no lengthening of the PR interval, just like in Wenke Bay. So this is called Morbid's type 2. Uh, now Morbid's type 2 is always a difficult situation. Morbid's type 2 will always progress to the complete heart block. So it is always uh, better to give more importance to Morbid's type 2 clinically. The block is most open below AV node. This is the problem. In here, the block is at the AV node. In the Morbid's type 2, the block is below the AV node, that is bundle of his, and may progress to the third, block, third heart block very, very uh, fast. So this is the third heart block or what we call the complete heart block. This is AV dissociation. P is falling. QRS is happening, but there is no relation. P is coming from the atria, QRS is coming from either junction or ventricles, but it is the P wave which is not conducting via the AV bundle to the ventricles. Therefore, this is called complete heart block. There is complete block at the AV node. No relationship between P and QRS, and accessory pathway in the lower chambers will typically activate the ventricle escape rhythm. Atrial rate is 60 to 100. Ventricle rate is based on the site of the escape pacemaker. And atrial and ventricle rhythm both are regular. This is regular. If we put again the paper strip and you mark a P wave, P wave, P wave, and you go on seeing the P waves, they are normally happening at a regular interval. Same way, if you put a paper strip and mark the QRS, these are regular. Look at the distance between the QRS, it's normal. Look at the distance between the P wave, it is also normal. But there is no whatsoever relation between P and QRS, and therefore this is called AV dissociation, third degree heart block, complete heart block. Now we come to the short PR intervals, the wolf parkinson white syndrome. This is an aberrant pathway in the atria that is bypassing the AV delay and uh, giving the direct uh, impulse to the ventricle. The short PR, PR interval is there, then there is suddenly QRS uh, wave, this we call it a delta wave, and then there, there will be a QRS complex. One bit from a rhythm strip in V2 demonstrating characteristic finding in the WP, not the characteristic delta wave. This is the blue bar. Above the blue bar is a delta wave. The short PR interval. The raw, this is the short PR interval. This is mostly less than 0 0.12. Here it is 0 0.08 second. And the long QRS complex, that is 0 0.12 second. Accessory pathway, bundle of Kent, always early activation of the ventricle. Therefore, there is a delta wave and short PR. Now the AV node delay is not here. So P, suddenly there is a ventricle complex, so short PR and delta wave. So this is the typical characteristic of all Parkinson white syndrome. This is very important because this can produce the supraventricular tachycardias. But this tachycardia, the SVT sometimes look bizarre. Eh? This will come with a broad QRS complex, might be mistaken as VT and patient might be treated as a VT. So it is always to look at the previous ECG. Suppose patient comes to you in a tachycardia, tachyarrhythmias, 
and if you have a previous ecg recorded in the normal sinus rhythm and you if you can find that is a delta wave short pr this is a wpw syndrome causing the svt and not vt and the management will change drastically the qrs complexes uh, as we saw previously the normal qrs complex is less than 3 small square that is 0 0.06 to 0 0.3 second and amplitude is the s in v1 and r in v5 is less than 3 Point five. So this is the normal QRS uh, complex uh, measurement. That is the if you see the its duration, then it is 0 0.06 to 0 0.10 second. Even if you see the voltage, Q wave amplitude is always less than uh, one square. This is always remember the Q wave is always less than one square. The R in V5 uh, and S in V1 should be less than 3.5. This is the normal QRS. Now, left bundle branch blocks is RSR dash pattern in V1, that is W shaped, and V6 is M shaped. So, always remember William. And whenever you are doing with the LBBB, remember the William, that is W in uh, V1 and M in V6. V5 and V6 is having this rabbit ear like RSR dash pattern, and then we call it a WP uh, LBBB. Whenever there is a RBBB, the RSR dash, RSR, RSR dash pattern or W pattern is in um, uh, uh, M like pattern is in V1 and V2 and W like pattern is in V6. So we call it marrow. Uh, you all uh, know what marrow is, so I don't go into the details. So uh, RSR dash pattern in V1 and W like in V6 is marrow. And uh, if there is a W like uh, pattern in V1 and M in V6, we call it William. So R L B B B is William and R B B B is Mel. ST segment, normal ST segment is always isoelectric. It is less than two to three small square. As I told you, remember the rule of three, three to five squares is PR, three squares is QRS, less than three square is ST. ST segment is always isoelectric and at the same level of the PR. Therefore, whenever there is isoelectric ST goes up, then the problem happens. We will see it in later slides. So now we are going to talk about the myocardial infarction. The most common uh, uh, indications for which we are getting the ECG done is diagnosis of the uh, cardiac ischemia. So there are two types of MI. The ST elevation MI, previously called the QMI, and non-ST elevation LY, previously called the non-QMI. We decide this by looking at the ST segments in all lip. Flat isoelectric at the same level with subsequent PR interval is the normal. Elevation or depression of the ST segment by 1 millimeter or more measured at the J point is abnormal. And J point is the point between the QRS and the ST segment. So location of the MI, as I told you before, anterior is V1 to V4. The affected coronary artery is left anterior descending. Septum is V1, V2. The affected artery is LED. Left lateral is 1 AVL V5, V6. The affected artery is left circumflex. Inferior is 2, 3 AVF. RCA is the affected artery. Right atrium AVR V1, the affected artery is RCA. Posterior is posterior chest leads. The RCA is culprit. Right ventricle, right sided leads. Then the RCA is the culprit. To help identify the MI, right side end and posterior lead should be applied. It is always a uh, customary to apply a right sided chest leads whenever you are dealing with an inferior wall MI because inferior is because of the RCA. Whenever the patient is in hypotension in the inferior wall MI, always suspect the RVMI. So in this case, just like V1, V2, V1 to V6, we put uh, the chest leads, put RV1 to RV6. So V1 will be same, then V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 go on the right side of the chest wall. So always apply the right leads. So, 1 AVL V5 V6 is lateral, V1 to V4 is uh, septal, V5 V6 is lateral, V1 to V4 we call it anteroseptal, V1 V2 is septal, V3 V4 is anterior, and 2 3 AVF are inferior, and RV1 to RV6 are the uh, right sided leads. The anterior and septal are supplied by the LED, left lateral circumflex, inferior by RCA, and right atrium and right ventricle by the RCA2. And all the S nodes, AV nodes will be supplied by mainly the RCA. So the conduction problems are more in cases of the uh, RCA territory problems. So the criteria of the myocardial infarction is the ST elevation in more than 2 mm in more than 2 chest leads. Whenever you see more than 2 mm ST elevation in more than 2 chest leads, then we can stem the case as a myocardial infarction. 
और एस टी एलिवेशन इन मोर देन टू लिम ब्लेड्स इक्वल्स टू मोर देन वन मिलीमीटर ऑफ द एलिवेशन सो वेन एवर वी आर सींग देश लिट्स That is V1 to V6. More than two leads should have more than two millimeter elevation. Whenever look, we are looking at the limb leads like one AVL, two, three AVL, then there should be more than one millimeter elevation in more than two limb leads. As we saw previously, the chest leads are in the proximity of the heart, so the electrical amplification is more. So therefore, the diagnosis we need more uh, elevation criteria. the limb leads are mostly augmented they are away from the heart so even a more than 1 mm elevation should be considered significant so st elevation more than 2 leads uh, chest leads more than 2 mm and limb leads more than 2 limb leads more than 1 mm and the q wave of more than one small square is pathological so here the uh, one small square uh, 1.5 two small squares q wave this is pathological st elevation around uh, 4 mm this is uh, significant now the definition of the pathological q wave we are not much concerned just see the q wave should be more than one small square then this is a pathological q wave and give importance to it now if you see the classical uh, revolution of the mi in the ecg in the zero hours there will be st elevation tall t in 1 to 24 hours there will be little bit of notching in the st elevation day 1 to 2 this will uh, be high st elevation the t wave inversion starts days later the st white come down but it is still not isoelectric and there will be t inversion and as the days pass the q wave deepens so weeks later you can only see the q wave and whenever there is only q no rs means this patient is having total dead myocardium suppose in v1 to v4 patient is only having uh, q wave and no positive deflection this means the v1 to v4 wall is dead there is no viable myocardium most probably and this is always associated with a inverted t wave now suppose this patient is having inverted t wave weeks later and this patient again gets the ischemia then this inverted t will again become upright t so any inversion of the t wave is suggestive of ischemia that means a positive deflection becoming negative is ischemia a negative deflection becoming positive is ischemia therefore it is not the uh inversion but it is the reversal of the t wave which indicates the ischemia so st segment elevation now look at this here the st is elevated in v1 uh, v2 v3 so this is a typical septal lead mi or we call the anterolateral mi because in one avl there is also st elevation more than 1 mm and here v5 v6 also there is a uh, much st elevation so v1 to v6 st elevation one avl st elevation more than 1 mm so we call it lateral plus anterior so this is a anterolateral mi now in this you can see two three avf there will be there is st elevation and there is st depression in v1 to v6 we call it a reciprocal st depression as these leads are away from the anterior leads whatever the vector is causing st elevation same vector is causing the st depression in the opposite sided leads so this is a inferior wall mi always take the right sided leads whenever you are dealing with the inferior wall mi lead 2 3 avf is suggesting a inferior wall mi now non st elevation mi non st st elevation mi or non qm mi also known as sub endocardial mi or non qmi in a patient with acute coronary syndrome in which the ect does not show st elevation but the enzymes are elevated now this is the difference between ischemia and non qmi and qmi qmi means there is st elevation non st elevation mi means there is no st elevation but trop i is high trop t is high then we call it non st elevation mi and if it is negative we call it unstable angina or ischemic heart disease so it is always important whenever you are dealing with st depression patient is having ongoing chest pain do the trop i trop t if they are positive it is non st elevation mi if they are negative the we are dealing with unstable angina ist now this is a typical classical example of a non st elevation mi here you can see there is a t wave inversion here there is a bit st elevation acute coronary syndrome with troponin increase arrows indicate ischemic st segment changes without appropriate treatment in many cases st infarction may happen it is not uh, like that the patient is having non st elevation mi so they will not develop the st elevation mi if delay treatment is there or some complication happens this patient can land up into st elevation mi now this is the myocardial ischemia you can see here the st depression of more than 2 mm with the t inversion in some leads this is ischemia but if you do the trop 
T level, this is normal, tropi level is normal, then this is not a non T a non ST elevation MI, this is just a myocardial ischemia or what we call the unstable angina. The ST depression is more than one millimeter symmetrical tall T wave and long QT interval. This is the typical angina picture. The ST depression, the symmetrical T wave and long QT interval. Pericarditis, whenever the, there is ST elevation in all the leads, all the leads are affected and there is a concavity upwards. If you see, this is like a, some stone is dipping inside a, a string of a cloth. This type of structure, this type of uh, morphology is only seen in pericarditis. All the leads are affected. That means this is not a global MI. And look at the ST elevation. This is not that much marked as that of a MI. And there is always a concavity upwards. So ST elevation with conclave shape mostly seen in all leads is pericarditis. Digoxin. Now there will be ST depression, but this will be a typical like a reverse tick. If you if you do a tick, if you do it a reverse tick, this is the reverse check sign, and this is mainly a supra therapeutic uh, digoxin level. You measure the digoxin level, and this will be very clear. Now how to uh, diagnose a left ventricular hypertrophy and a right ventricular hypertrophy? For that, you have to look at the R wave and the S wave. There is a criteria. Uh, there are two, three criteria. The Sokolov and Lyon criteria is S in V1 plus R in V5, V6 more than 35. Don't remember the name. Just remember S in V1 plus R and R in V5 or V6 is more than 35. Here S in V1 is 15. R in V5 is 25. So total is 40. More than 35 is left ventricular hypertrophy. Another coronal criteria is S in V3 plus R in AVL more than, uh, more than in 28 in men and more than 20 in women. Here S in V3 is 15, uh, R in AVL is 14. If you combine the two, it is 29. So it fits into the criteria of the LVH. And another is R in AVL more than 13 millimeter. Look at the R in the AVL. If it is more than 13 millimeter, this is LVH. If you see these tracings, the mostly V5, V6, when they are having very tall R, it has to be RVH. But always measure the R in V5 or V6 and S in V1 and do the total it should be more than 40 remember any one criteria and i i think that r in v5 s in v1 more than 40 is more than enough to diagnose a case of light ventricular hypertrophy but for theoretical discussions you should remember that r in v5 v6 s in v1 more than 35 r in avl s in v3 is more than 28 in men 20 in women or only r in avl more than 13 is enough to as a diagnostic criteria of lvh left ventricular hypertrophy now, these are the left ventricular hypertrophy examples. Look at the big R waves, big S waves, R in V5, S in V1 is more than uh, 40 as we have seen in the previous slides. And there is a T inversion. Now, this is called strain pattern, left ventricular hypertrophy with strain. This is not an ischemia, it is a strain pattern. And always remember that whenever you are not getting T inversion in other leads, but only in lateral leads, like in V5, V6, 1 AVL, and there is a associated LVH. This is a LV hypertrophic strain, mainly seen in chronic hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension, severe aortic stenosis, where you can get this type, and of course the uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy. The right ventricular hypertrophy is reversed. R in V1 is large, S in V6 is uh, negative. So whenever you are getting S in V5, V6, uh, that is negative deflection, which is most uh, probably uh, in uh, most other cases, the V5 and V6 are positive deflections. Whenever you are getting negative deflections in V5, V6 and positive in V1, V2, this is right ventricular hypertrophy. So V1, R uh, is more than S and in V6, S is larger than the R. This is called right ventricular hypertrophy. When it is associated with inverted T, we call it RV strain pattern. This is made, mainly seen in primary pulmonary hypertensions, COPD, core pulmonale, and other right ventricular uh, associated problems. So LVH is mainly seen in uncontrolled hypertension, long-standing hypertension, aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation. But in aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, there will be only LVH, no LV strain pattern. In case of the hypertension, aortic stenosis, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you will see the LVH with strain. In AR and MR, you will only see the LV hypertrophy, not the strain. In RVH, pulmonary hypertension, tetralogy of pallot, pulmonary vas stenosis, VSD, high altitude, cardiac fibrosis, COPD, and athletic heart syndrome. These are the causes of the right ventricular hypertrophy. Now we come to a very important part that is QT interval. Beginning of Q to end of the T. 
the less than two large square the rough phenomena is uh, beginning of q to end of t should occupy not more than two large squares if it's more is occupying more than two large square we can call it a prolonged qt interval normal qt is between 0.35 to 0.45 problem is this qt uh, varies with tachycardia varies with uh, other conditions so we have come to um, uh, another criteria that is corrected qt interval corrected qt is qt upon under root rr so uh, corrected QT, you can measure it uh, manually also, but most of the computerized machines will give corrected QT interval for you. Uh, the principle is, the rough principle is, whenever you are looking at the normal ECG, look at the consecutive RR and you measure the QT. This QT should not be more than half of the RR interval. If your RR interval is 20 uh, squares, the QT interval should not be more than 10 squares. If your RR interval is occupying four large squares, then your QT should not occupy more than two large squares. So you uh, lose lead uh, two or V5. Uh, if the lead two cannot be read, you can use the V5. And you can measure this QT interval by drawing a line from the Q wave and, the, and this T wave. You, uh, you, this tangent line, and whenever it meets the baseline, you draw a straight line. And at the beginning of Q, you draw a straight line and measure this. This is the QT interval. The rough estimate, just remember, it should be less than half of your RR interval. If it is more than the RR interval uh, or more than half of the RR interval, just suspect the prolonged QT. So here the RR interval is 18. If you measure the QT, it is 10. So it is more than the half of the RR. Therefore, this can be a prolonged QT interval. If you measure by this formula, then the QT will be 0 0.47 second. Anything, anything more than 0 0.450 is prolonged QT. And uh, therefore, uh, this can happen because of uh, congenital syndrome called prolonged QT syndrome. This can happen because of the medication, antiarrhythmic, tricyclic antidepressant, phenothiazides, electrolyte imbalance, ischemia. Calcium is more important. Always remember hypo. Whenever the calcium is low, QT gets high. Whenever the calcium is high, QT gets low. So there is a reverse relation of hypocalcemia, prolonged QT, hypercalcemia, short QT. QT prolongation is often treated with beta blockers. Third treatment of QT prolongation is beta blocker. Now, uh, in COVID era, the QT prolongation has come into more focus because of the hydroxychloroquine used as a treatment. The azithromycin is used as the treatment and both can prolong the QT interval. So whenever you are giving both, this can cause the QT prolongation and arrhythmias. The long QT syndrome is the inborn problem. Example are Jervan and Lang Nelson syndrome and Roman Ward syndrome, where you can get this uh, prolonged QT uh, waves. The T wave, the normal T wave is asymmetrical. The first half is having more gradual slope than the second half. The uh, more, more than one eighth and less than two third of the amplitude of the corresponding R wave rarely exceeds 10 millimeter. They are mostly less than the 10 millimeter. They cannot be more than two large squares. Mostly it is the one large square is its height and they are symmetrical, tall peak and biphasic and uh, sometimes it's inverted. The U wave is the uh, first deflection, small deflection which comes after the T and it is not a P. Something between P and T is the U wave, not commonly seen, mainly it's seen in hypothermia and hypokalemia. Small round symmetrical positive leads in T2, it is the same direction of the T wave in that leads. And as I told you, this is mainly seen in um, hypercalcemia, thyrotoxicosis, exposure to digital is epinephrine and other epidemics. Congenital Q, long QT can also give the um, appearance of the U wave. And in setting of the intracranial hemorrhage, when there is a very high intracranial pressure, the U wave can come. Other ECG signs, the hyperkalemia, there will be tall, very tall T waves. The T wave can reach up to the height of the R. This is either because of the early reproduction, but whenever you are getting a tall, very picked T wave, always think of the hyperkalemia. Particularly when the patient is in CRF, creatine is very high, always measure the potassium level. This is a ripe threatening condition. If not treated, the patient can go into ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Hypokalemia, the patient will have inverted T and U waves. The T wave becomes flattened, then it can uh, get inverted. The U wave appears, the ST segment may become, uh, become depressed and the T wave becomes inverted with a severe hypokalemia. Hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia, as I told previously, hypercalcemia will produce short QT, hypercalcemia will produce long QT. So there is inverse relation, more calcium, short interval, less calcium, long interval. 
Now pulmonary embolism. Remember S1, Q3, Q3, T3. Whenever there is S in the 1, Q in the 3 and T inversion in 3, always suspect the pulmonary embolism. This is called S1, Q3, T3 phenomena. Deep S wave in lead 1, pathological Q wave in lead 3 with the inverted T wave, S1, Q3, T3, always suspect the pulmonary embolism. There is some degree of RVH which can happen if its um, uh, pulmonary embolism has caused the RV problems. Otherwise, in very early phase, in acute phase, the S1, Q3, T3 is the diagnostic criteria for uh, suspecting pulmonary embolism by looking at the ECG. That's all. Now, just uh, find some ECGs, make a practice look at the ECGs. Don't directly look at the computerized interpretation. Just think of it, just measure the intervals. The more ECGs you see, the more uh, uh, you will be accustomed and you will become master at the end. Uh, 